Thank you, Bruce. And thank you, First Baptist, for, for hosting this. And thank you all for coming. Um, I have the, the advantage of having a much better evening than when Reverend Wilderspin spoke in November. It was absolutely horrible outside. And he still had a great crowd. I'm very pleased to be part of this speaker series uh, and to talk about this poem to a room full of adults. You are not my usual audience. Nobody is texting and nobody is watching YouTube. I have to say that it was a little bit intimidating thinking about talking to people who are going to listen. I think of the inside of my head as a stew and sometimes unexpected things burble to the top. This happened one day when I was driving to Ottawa and this phrase popped into my head for absolutely no logical reason. The phrase, Jews are born, Christians are made. Jews are born, Christians are made. I still have no idea why that visited me. But in the course of turning it over and over in my head like a song that you can't get rid of, I realize that it is the thread that holds the talks in the speaker series together. Spreading the gospel has been the work of Christianity from the very beginning of Christianity. In John Wilderspin's marvelous talk in November on the, his, on the making of the English Bible, he told of how again and again, historical and political circumstances came to bear on translations of the Bible and their subsequent distribution. There were so many and sometimes so radically different situations, and yet they all in, had in common the desire to get the word of God and the story of Jesus to the people through, through the written word. In March, as Bruce said, Janice McIntyre is going to talk about the importance of hymns in spreading the word. And tonight I'm going to talk about yet another way in a much earlier time. I'm going to start with a thumbnail sketch of the Dark Ages in England and then talk a little about the poem. And then we're going to read the poem together. And after that, if you have questions, we can have a discussion. In 500 BC, and I hope you don't mind that I use BC and AD because CE and BCE, when I'm, I get them mixed up. So um, I'm going to use the old version. In 500 BC, a group of people we call the Celts migrated to Britain and Ireland from the continent. They were not actually a single group of people, but a collection of groups that didn't always get along with each other. When the Romans invaded England in 55 BC, they drove the Celts northward, and the, the Celts weren't happy about it. The Romans eventually had to build Hadrian's Wall to defend themselves against Celtic, Pictish, and Scottish invasions. South of the Wall, the Romans established themselves as administrators of what became Britann Britannia province of the Roman Empire. Most business was conducted in the center of the island, and before too long, the resource-rich and valuable colony was thriving and thoroughly Romanized. In addition to building roads and baths and establishing London as an important commercial center, the Romans also brought Christianity to the extent that early in the fourth century, three British bishops attended a church council in France. In the first half of the fifth century, a Roman Briton whom we know as St. Patrick took Christianity to Ireland. In 455 AD, the Roman army left England to go home and defend Rome against the invading barbarians from the east, leaving the Britons in the Romanized part of England at the mercy of the Scots and the Picts who decided that it was time to reclaim the southern lands. We don't know many details uh, about what happened, but the traditional story is that the Britons made a deal with three mercenary Germanic tribes, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes, and asked them to help defend the Britons against the Celtic tribes. The Angles, Saxons, and Jutes did as they were asked, and then they turned on the Britons, demanding land, seizing power, and slaughtering or colonizing their former employers. The Angles, Saxons, and Jutes settled in and intermarried with the Britons, and the culture of the Romanized Britons was eventually subsumed by that of the German tribes. Britons seemed to have been a pretty malleable people. When the, when the Romans were there, they were Romanized. When the Saxons came, they were Saxonized. In any case, over time, the Britons adopted the dress, language, and culture of the Germanic tribes. 
As a result of these developments, the early version of the English language emerged, Old English, which, is, which you can see on the handout, um, doesn't resemble modern English much at all. Anglo-Saxon England didn't resemble Roman England either. Unlike the Romans who were urban dwellers who built with stone, the Germanic tribes were rural and built with wood. Germanic tribes organized their societies not around a family or city-state, but around a male leader and his warrior band. Even back then, they had a reputation. The Roman historian Tacitus wrote of the German tribes, quote, they are not so easily persuaded to plow the earth and to wait for the year's produce as they are to challenge an enemy and earn the honor of wounds. They actually think it tame and stupid to acquire by the sweat of toil what they might win by their blood, end quote. The Germanic heroic tradition that the Angles and the Saxons brought with them to England celebrated courage, mastery, and aggressive action. As in Christianity, love was the cultural pole star. But in Germanic warrior culture, the highest form of love was not spiritual or familial or sexual. The highest form of love existed between a thane, or a liege lord, and his retainers, or liegemen. This love was marked by loyalty, devotion, and service, and it was reciprocal. The thane was as obligated to serve and care for his retainers as they were to serve and obey him. Angles and Saxons had a writing system of runic carvings, but no real culture of literacy existed. It was almost entirely an oral culture. Their economy was based on barter and gift exchange and not on money. Their religion was pagan. They worshiped a pantheon of northern gods, including Woden and Thor. And almost the only thing that survives from that period of, uh, of, of English history is Woden's Day, which is Wednesday, and Thor's Day, which is Thursday. For a time, Christianity lingered only in the margins. But in the sixth century, Pope Gregory sent Augustine on a mission to England. And as, as Reverend Wilderspin said in November, that wasn't the Augustine, the one who wrote the Confessions. It was uh, St. Augustine who became the, the Bishop of Canterbury. Because a Christian culture already existed, even though it was far from thriving, Augustine found it relatively easy to convert the people. Christianity spread quickly, not only because of the spiritual benefits it offered, but also because of alliances that could be made between Christianized kings. At that time, England was a loose collection of kingdoms, principalities, and fiefdoms. And in fact, the church represented the only real unity that England had. In the middle of the seventh century, the Synod of Whitby brought England officially into the Roman Catholic fold with other European countries. By the beginning of the eighth century, Christianity was well enough established that the English could send missionaries back to Germany to convert the Saxons there. The Irish missionaries established monasteries in the north, and monastic culture flourished. It's really thanks to the monks that we know just about everything we know about that period because they were about the only people around who could read and write. It was the Irish monks who established the manuscript tradition that resulted in the Book of Kells and the enormously important Lindisfarne Gospels. To the church, we owe our first great historian of England, the Venerable Bede. Bede was a monk who seemingly collected all sorts of traditional lore, combined it with the history of the church in England, and wrote the ecclesiastical history of the English people. He wrote it in Latin and completed it in the year 731. The importance of the attitude of the church toward its English outpost can't be underestimated. Pope Gregory told his bishops to destroy the idols in the temples, but not to destroy the temples themselves. Instead, he told them, quote, that the nation, seeing that their temples are not destroyed, may remove error from their hearts, and knowing and adoring the true God, may the more familiarly resort to the places to which they have been accustomed, End quote. That's a pretty tolerant and far-sighted position for an evangelizing religion to take, and the strategy worked. The Germanic tribes adapted the new religion to their own cultural heritage, adopted it over time, and paganism in England died a quiet, painless, and bloodless death. The monasteries remained the most important sites of Christian culture, 
and fostered the medieval belief that God was best served by living a life of prayer and contemplation away from the world. The monks lived a life of work, communal prayer, and study, and they also undertook to preserve and in some cases create cultural artifacts and intellectual life. And the, the illuminated manuscripts are a, an example of that, that they're creating these, these artifacts that were, that were both, they combined the, the present of the time and also the past from long before they got there. Latin was the language of the church and both church and classical texts were read and copied in the monasteries. Things were actually by this time going really, really well uh, until the end of the 8th century when the Vikings showed up. Wave after wave of Viking invaders demolished the physical evidence of Christian culture, burning monasteries and libraries as they made their way, made their way south, destroying both Lindisfarne and Bede's monastery, Jarrow. This went on and on and on for a couple of centuries until King Alfred, deservedly known as Alfred the Great, raised a substantial army and eventually drove the Vikings out for good. It's an interesting side note that the Vikings inadvertently united England because all of those principalities and kingdoms and all those different people, actually many of them united under Alfred for the first time um, and, and England wasn't just this collection. Alfred also plays an important part in our story because he loved learning and prompted the translation of both Christian and classical Latin text into vernacular Old English, including Bede's ecclesiastical history. And Old English was primarily a spoken language um, and it remained the vernacular language until 1066 when William the Conqueror brought French and that became the language of the court and then the, the Latin, the, the Anglo-Saxon and French combined into what we know as Middle English. Whereas if you look at a text in, um, in Old English script, you probably can't understand anything. But if you look at a, a text in Middle English, you can make out a lot of what's going on um, without, if you sound it out. So that's a, a thumbnail sketch of the history of England in the Dark Ages. Um, and I'm gonna keep coming back to it. You sort of have to have that background um, in order to talk about the poem. You see on the program that the Dream of the Rood is recorded in the Vercelli manuscript. Um, the Vercelli manuscript was written in Southeast England in the later 10th century and ended up in the Italian town of Vercelli 100 years later. We don't know exactly how it got there, but Vercelli was an important stop on the pilgrimage route from England to Rome, um, and so that seems the logical explanation. Parts of the poem exist in a couple of other places, um, notably on the Ruthwell Cross near the Scottish border, and there's a picture, I think, in, your, in, the, in the handout of that as well. This cross has been dated to the early 8th century, um, and it's inscribed with scenes from the Gospels and the lives of the saints. The writing is a combination of Latin and Anglo-Saxon runes. If the runes are original, and nobody has carbon dated it or whatever they can do now to, to, to determine exactly how old things are, um, if the runes are original, that makes the dream of the rood among the very oldest. Um, old English poems. There's also a silver cross in Brussels that's inscribed with lines that are similar to those in the poem, The Dream of the Rood. It's always good to start by reading of things, um, and although poems didn't have titles, uh, this one was later. I'm just cutting in and out. Um, a rood is a cross. For centuries, Rood has referred specifically to the cross on which Jesus died. But before that, it was just a word that meant pole or cross, such as the ones on which criminals were executed. The dream in the title refers to the fact that this is a dream vision, a very popular narrative strategy at a time when people believe strongly in the prophetic power of dreams. So there are a lot of, it's a, it was a, a it was very authoritative if something happened in a dream, and so there are a lot of dream visions in, in Old English and Middle English poetry. You know, all poems are artifacts. They're, they're not, they, even if they, no matter how natural they seem, um, and especially if it's a fixed form poet, poem, nobody speaks spontaneously in sonnets. So in that sense, they're, they're created, they're artifacts. 
Um, and no matter how much a poem is based on the life or experience of the poet, the poem itself is a crafted thing and a rhetorical performance. It's especially true that a poem is a rhetorical performance in periods where oral cultures took precedence over written cultures, because poetry really is intended to be heard rather than read. So one of the steps in crafting a poem is that the poet creates a speaker of the poem, like an author creates the narrator of a story. The Dream of the Rood has two speakers. The first speaker is the dreamer. He lives in a world like our world, except that it's Anglo-Saxon. And he opens and closes the poem, the center of which is the narration of his dream. Within his narration of the dream, the rood, the cross itself, becomes the second speaker. The subject of the poem is the dream, and the subject of the dream is the crucifixion. The story of the crucifixion is definitely Christian, but in the dream of the rood, it's not strictly Matthew 27 on which the poem is based. While remaining true in every important sense to Matthew, the poem's crucifixion is also inflected by the heroic warrior culture of the Anglo-Saxons. When Christians consider the crucifixion uh, in, in modern times, we tend to regard the crucifixion itself as an experience of great sorrow and suffering that ultimately led to really good things. The Anglo-Saxons weren't having any of that. In their version, as set out in the Dream of the Rood, Christ is not the sufferer. He is crucified, but his suffering isn't even mentioned in the story proper. Instead, Christ is a hero who embraces his execution by his, execution by his enemy, enemies with all the courage and confidence of someone who knows he's already won. In addition, Christ is both the Lord, in a Christian sense, and a Lord, in the Anglo-Saxon sense of being a liege lord. He's a thane and a leader of men. And Christ is a thorough hero. There is suffering in the story. There has to be. But it gets transferred in the poem so as not to undermine the heroic qualities of Christ. And, and in early the early in this, this early representations of Christ, Christ was often represented as a, as a, um, a warrior doing battle with the devil. So it, 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 for original listeners and, and readers of this poem, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't out of the ordinary at all. In this poem, rather than Christ suffering the crucifixion, it's the cross that suffers. Christ, in this version, is courageous, willing, and active. The cross is vulnerable, reluctant, passive, and thoroughly miserable. Remember, in German warrior tradition, the highest form of love is that between a thane and a retainer. Here, Christ is the thane, the liege lord, and the cross is the loyal retainer whose love for his lord forces him to become the instrument of his lord's execution. It's a pretty sophisticated plot that works on a lot of levels. In Anglo-Saxon culture, a liege lord rewarded his retainers with gifts. In practice, that meant that when they overran and pillaged a settlement, the spoils were divided among the liegemen, and the liegemen didn't regard the spoils as their due. They regarded the spoils as gifts from their, their liege lord. The cross then has to be rewarded for his loyalty. And he is, it is, by becoming a spectacular symbol to be gazed at by all creation. In the poem, the cross is streaming with blood one minute and studded with sparkling jewels the next. But it's always a spectacle in the true sense of that word, something to be looked at with awe. Of course, the crucifixion has a lot to recommend it as a story. It's dramatic and gripping and full of pathos. It's also full of paradoxes, tragedy and triumph, suffering and splendor, action and passion. But that's not all. In the poem, as in the Bible, the crucifixion is only half the story. The cross tells the story of the crucifixion to the dreamer, and then something happens to the dreamer. The dreamer, who is aware of his own sinfulness, repents and is saved by the cross. His penance 
is to tell the story of his dream to others. And who does he tell it to? He tells it to us in the, in the poem. Why? So we can also be saved. So it's a pretty clever little piece of evangelization um, that, that uh, has a lot of layers. Okay, so I'm going to read the poem um, all the way through once, and you've got copies of it, so you can read it along with me. Um, and then I'm going to go back over it and talk about it in terms of, uh, of what, what I've been talking about. Listen, I will speak of the sweetest dream, what came to me in the middle of the night when speech bearers slept in their rest. It seemed that I saw a most wondrous tree raised on high, circled round with light, the brightest of beams. All that beacon was covered in gold. Gems stood fair at the earth's corners, and five there were up on the crossbeam. All the angels of the Lord looked on, fair through all eternity. That was no felon's gallows, but holy spirits beheld him there, men over the earth and all this glorious creation. Wondrous the victory tree, and I was fouled by sins, wounded with guilt. I saw the tree of glory honored in garments, shining with joys. Bedecked with gold, gems had covered worthily the creator's tree. And yet beneath that gold, I began to see an ancient wretched struggle, for it first began to bleed on the right side. I was all beset with sorrows, fearful for that fair vision. I saw that eager beacon change garments and colors. Now it was drenched, stained with blood, now bedecked with treasure. And yet, lying there a long while, I beheld in sorrow the Savior's tree until I heard it utter a sound. That best of woods began to speak words. It was so long ago, I remember it still, that I was felled from the forest's edge, ripped up from my roots. Strong enemies seized me there, made me their spectacle, made me their, bear their criminals. They bore me on their shoulders and then set me on a hill. Enemies enough fixed me fast. Then I saw the Lord of mankind hasten eagerly when he wanted to ascend onto me. There I dare not bow down nor break against the Lord's word when I saw the ends of the earth tremble. Easily I might have felled all those enemies, and yet I stood fast. Then the young hero made ready that was God Almighty, strong and resolute. He ascended on the high gallows, brave in the sight of many, when he wanted to ransom mankind. I trembled when he embraced me, but I bared, dared not bow to the ground or fall to the earth's corners. I had to stand fast. I was reared as a cross. I raised up the mighty king, the Lord of heaven, I dared not lie down. They drove dark nails through me. The scars are still visible, open wounds of hate. I dared not harm any of them. They mocked us both together. I was drenched with blood flowing from that man's side after he had sent forth his spirit. Much have I endured on that hill of hostile fates. I saw the God of hosts cruelly stretched out Darkness had covered with its clouds the ruler's corpse, that shining radiance. Shadows spread gray under the clouds. All creation wept, mourned the king's fall, Christ on the cross. And yet from afar men came hastening to that noble one. I watched it all. I was all beset with sorrow, yet I sank into their hands humbly, eagerly. There they took Almighty God, lifted him from his heavy torment, that warriors then left me standing drenched in blood, all shot through with arrows. They laid him down, bone weary, and stood by his body's head. They watched the Lord of heaven there, who rested a while, weary from his mighty battle. They began to build a tomb for him in the sight of his slayer. They carved it from bright stone and set within the Lord of victories. They began to sing a dirge for him, Wretched at evening, when they wished to travel hence, weary from the glorious Lord, he rested there with little company. And as we stood there, weeping a long while, fixed in our station, the song ascended from those warriors. The corpse grew cold, the fair life house. Then they began to fell us all to the earth, a terrible fate. They dug for us a deep pit, yet the Lord's thane's friends found me there, adorned me with gold and silver. 
Now you can hear, my dear hero, that I have endured the work of evildoers, harsh sorrows. Now the time has come that far and wide they honor me, men over the earth and all this glorious creation, and pray to this sign. On me the Son of God suffered for a time, and so, glorious now, I rise up under the heavens and am able to heal each of those who, in awe of, who is in awe of me. Once I was made into the worst of torments, most hateful to all people, before I opened the true way of life for speech bearers. Lo, the King of glory, guardian of heaven's kingdom, honored me over all the trees of the forest, just as he is also almighty God, honored his mother Mary herself, above all womankind, for the sake of all men. Now I bid you, my beloved hero, that you reveal this vision to men, Tell them in words that it is the tree of glory on which Almighty God suffered for mankind's many sins and Adam's ancient deeds. Death he tasted there, yet the Lord rose again with his great might to help mankind. He ascended into heaven. He will come again to this middle earth to seek mankind on doomsday. Almighty God, the Lord himself and his angels with him, and he will judge. He has the power of judgment each one of them as they have earned beforehand here in this loaned life. No one there may be unafraid at the words which the ruler will speak. He will ask before the multitude where the man might be, who for the Lord's name would taste bitter death, as he did earlier on that tree. But they will tremble then and little think what they might even begin to say to Christ. But no one there need be very afraid, who has borne in his breast the best of beacons, But through the cross shall seek the kingdom every soul from this earthly way, whoever thinks to rest with the ruler. Then I prayed with a happy heart, eagerly there where I was alone with little company. My spirit longed to start the journey forth. It has felt so much of longing. It is now my life's hope that I may seek the tree of victory alone more often than all men and honor it well. I wish for that with all my heart, and my hope of protection is fixed on the cross. I have few wealthy friends on earth. They all have gone forth, fled from worldly joys, and sought the King of glory. They live now in heaven with the High Father and dwell in glory, and each day I look forward to the time when the cross of the Lord on which I have looked while here on this earth will fetch me from this loaned life and bring me where there is great bliss, joy in heaven, where the Lord's host is seated at the feast with ceaseless bliss, and then set me where I may afterwards dwell in glory, share joy fully with the saints." May the Lord be my friend, he who here on earth once suffered on the hanging tree for human sin. He ransomed us and gave us life, a heavenly home. Hope was renewed with cheer and bliss for those who were burning there. The sun was successful in that journey, mighty and victorious, when he came with a multitude, a great host of souls, into God's kingdom, the one ruler almighty, the angels rejoicing, and all the saints already in heaven dwelling in glory when Almighty God, their ruler, returned to his rightful home. Okay. That was pretty long, but it, it helps, I think, to hear any poem um, once all the way through. And in fact, when I'm teaching poetry, I tell my students, I don't know if they pay any attention to me, um, that when, they're, when we're doing poetry, they should, read, they should read a poem three times before they come to class, the first time out loud, the second time looking carefully through it as they, as they go through and figuring out each thing and then, and then reading it a third time, um, trying to get the, whole, the sense of the poem as a whole. So we're only going to do the first two, uh, the first two parts of that process. Okay, so the dream of the word begins with the speaker of the, being the, the dreamer. The dreamer, the I, in those first lines is the, the dreamer. Listen, I will speak the sweetest of dreams, what came to me in the middle of the night when speech bearers slept in their rest. Okay, so there's the the context. Um, It seemed that I saw a most wondrous tree raised on high, circled with light, the brightest of beams. All that beacon was covered in gold. Gems stood fair at the earth's corners, and five there were upon the crossbeam. All the angels of the Lord looked on, fair through all eternity. That was no felon's gallows, but holy spirits beheld him there, men over the earth, all this glorious creation. So he's talking about what the, what the dream, what he saw in the dream. And at first there, were, there was no other action in the dream except, uh, except the cross. And when he first sees the cross, the cross is studded with jewels and it's, it's glorious. Um, and all of creation, he, he's, he dreams, is, is looking at it. And then he thinks about himself. 
in relation to this amazing vision. Wondrous the victory tree, and I was fouled by sins, wounded with guilt. I saw the tree of glory honored in garments, shining with joys, bedecked with gold. Um, and, and he goes on, gems had covered worthily the creator's tree. And yet beneath that gold, I began to see an ancient, wretched struggle, for it first began to bleed on the right side. So he's dreaming all this of the, of the church, the, and he sees the, the bejeweled, be, bejeweled cross suddenly begin to bleed, and he had, begins to have this knowledge of, of something that happened um, a long time ago. Um, and, and he watches and it becomes drenched. Um, I was all beset with sorrows, fearful for that fair vision because he doesn't want the vision, the beautiful vision to, to be marred into something else. I saw that eager beaker ch- beacon change garments and colors. Now it was drenched, stained with blood, now bedecked with treasure. And yet lying there a long while, I beheld in sorrow the Savior's tree until I heard it utter a sound. The best of woods began to speak words. So the, he's just in the dream. He is watching this vision, feeling um, uh, empathy with the cross for what's happening to it visually. But then all of a sudden, the cross begins to speak. And you see on the poem, on the page, that there are quotation marks. And the quotation marks actually begin here and end at the point where the cross stops speaking. So this is the, the heart of the poem in, in, and the, the crucifixion story that's told um, by a personified cross. So now the eye is not the dreamer, but the eye is, is the cross. It was so long ago, I remember it still, that I was felled from the forest's edge, ripped up from my roots. Strong enemies seized me there, made me their spectacle, made me bear their criminals. They bore me on their shoulders and then set me on a hill. Enemies enough fixed me fast. So I mean, we don't think of the, of the origins of the cross as being something that was once naturally growing in the woods and was for some reason or other for its strength um, taken out of its element and, um, and used as an instrument of, of execution. Um, so he's not happy about any of that. He, he, it, the cross is not happy about any of that, but he... Um, Then something happens. Then I saw the Lord of mankind hasten eagerly when he wanted to ascend onto me. There I dared not bow down or break against the Lord's word when I saw the ends of the earth tremble. Easily I might have felled all those enemies, and yet I stood fast. Then the young hero made ready that was God Almighty, strong and resolute. He ascended on the high gallows, brave in the sight of many, when he wanted to ransom mankind. I trembled when he embraced me, but I dared not bow to the ground or fall to the earth's corners. I had to stand fast. I was reared on a cross. As a cross, I raised up the mighty king, the Lord of heaven. I dared not lie down. They drove dark nails through me. The scars are still visible, open wounds of hate. I dared not harm any of them. They mocked us both together. I was all drenched with blood flowing from that man's side after he had sent forth his spirit. So in that passage, the, the cross talks about the actual crucifixion. And the, the last line is the line where Christ dies on the cross. And you can see the, the extent to which the, all the suffering is transferred to the cross and all the heroism is transferred to Christ. The words that are used um, to, to describe Christ, he hastens eagerly to embrace his fate when he wanted to ascend on me. And why does he want to? What makes him so eager? Okay, he's doing his father's will, and what else? I'm sorry. To save mankind. To save mankind, and also, what else? Well, well, in the writer's point of view, he's fulfilling his role, which you spoke of, like the, uh, the Christ, the, uh, uh, the heroic Lord. Okay. The heroic Lord is eager to go into battle, even though he knows he might be killed. Okay, uh, but what else does Christ know? That he is already won. Okay, that he's already won. That he's he's going to win. So he, I mean, it's it, even though it's so different from Matthew twenty-seven. It's it, I mean, there's a real plausibility uh, in the way that they have they've changed things around. Um, so he wanted to ascend. He's really eager. Um, and that there's the anxiety of the cross here. The cross it, it doesn't want to be a part of this. 
the cross figures that he could fall over and kill some of the Roman soldiers, but can't. And why can't he? Sorry? Stuck in the ground. <laughs> See, he's stuck in the ground, but this is, there are miracles happening here. Yeah. Okay, he would be letting down his Lord. This is something that he has to do. And, and it's horrible. He hates it. The cross does not like this situation at all. He doesn't like being the instrument of killing Christ. Um, and so he keeps thinking about it all through this passage. He keeps thinking about what he could do to, to, if only he could. But the reason isn't that he's stuck in the ground. It's the, I mean, that too. But um, he's, um, he's got to obey the Lord. Um, and so he, uh, the cross trembles. He has a real, the cross has a really clear sense of this being a very, very big occasion, a very momentous occasion. Um, and he's, he's, um, he raises up the mighty king of heaven. He dares not lie down. And the nails get driven into the cross. And it's the cross that is covered with blood. And of course, in Matthew, he, we have a much more um, literal and graphic a description of that. Then after Christ is dead, the, the cross isn't finished, uh, talking about that experience. He, much have I endured on that hill of hostile fates. I saw the God of hosts cruelly stretched out. Darkness had covered with its clouds the ruler's corpse, that shining radiance. Shadows spread gray under the clouds. All creation wept, mourned the king's fall, Christ on the cross. And yet from afar, men came hastening to that noble one. I watched it all. I was all beset with sorrow, yet I sank into their hands, humbly, eagerly. There they took Almighty God, lifted him from his heavy torment. The warriors then left me, standing drenched in blood, all shot through with arrows. What happens in, in Matthew? What happens to Christ's body? OK, when I ask my students this, I know that most of them actually don't know, but you all do know. <laughs> Okay, and who was they? Oh, the, they, they, um, they had to ask, people had to ask permission, the people who came had to ask permission to take him down. Who, who's they in the Bible? His disciples, okay. Um, and what do they do with him? Okay, they put him in a tomb where no man had ever laid. That's not what happens in this version. They, this is, they, they take some uh, liberties here the Anglo-Saxons. Um, here, the warriors come. The rest of the retainers come. Christ's band comes, analogous to his disciples. Um, they, ta they take him off of the cross, um, and they, um, they lay him out. Um, and it's still the cross that's drenched in blood and shot through with arrows. They laid him down, bone-weary, and stood by his body's head, they watched the Lord of heaven there, who rested a while, weary from his mighty battle. They began to build a tomb for him in the sight of his slayer. They carved it from bright stone and set within the Lord of victories. They began to sing a dirge for him, wretched at evening when they wished to travel hence, weary from the glorious Lord. He rested there with little company. And as we stood there, weeping a long while, fixed in our station, the song ascended from those warriors. The corpse grew cold, the fair life house. Then they began to fell us all to the earth. A terrible fate. So what, what's, what do you think is happening here? Instead of the disciples coming and putting him in a, in a new hewn tomb that nobody had ever used. What, what's happening in this version? Okay, he's, he's, he's lying out in the open for the time being. And what are they, what are they doing? Yeah. They're giving him a wake, and they're giving him a warrior's funeral. So they, they I guess the, whoever the poet was who wrote this thought that that would be inconsistent for the, the way it happened in Matthew to happen here. If, if he's a, Christ is a warrior, his retainers wouldn't just go put him somewhere, they would have a funeral for him and sing dirges for him, um, and, which is a very tra sorrowful event for the cross, who's still up 
he's still in the ground, it's still in the ground, um, and watching this. Um, and, and they stay with the, they stay with the corpse until the body is, is cold. Then those lines, then they began to fell us all to the earth, a terrible fate. Who do you think us is? The three crosses. Okay, so, so the, now the crosses are coming down and the cross the, who's speaking doesn't know what's happening. Um, they dug for us a deep pit, yet the Lord's thanes frowned me there, adorned me with gold and silver, which is, of course, uh, anticipates a resurrection that's later to come. The cross is buried and then it, he's, he's dug up um, and adorned with gold and silver. Now you can hear, my dear hero, that I have endured the work of evildoers, harsh sorrows. And one of the, the, almost the only thing I don't like about this translation is that the cross calls the dreamer my dear hero, and it's confusing after the heroic Christ. And in, in a lot of translations, he says, my, my loved man or my beloved man. Um, but the, the, my dear hero here is the, is the dreamer. So the cross is, we lose the sense that in the dream, the cross is talking to the dreamer. He always is, but we get caught up in the story, as does the dreamer. And now we're brought back to the realization that the cross in the dream is actually speaking to the dreamer who's having the dream. Now the time has come that far and wide they honor me, men over the earth and all this glorious creation, and pray to this sign. On me the Son of God suffered for a time, and so glorious now I rise up under the heavens and am able to heal each of those who is in awe of me. Once I was made into the worst of torments, most hateful to all people, before I opened the true way of life for speech bearers. Lo, the King of glory, guardian of heaven's kingdom, honored me over all the trees of the forest, just as he is also Almighty God, or honored his mother, Mary herself, above all womankind, for the sake of all men. So the, the cross acquires power and, and a healing power as a reward for his suffering for the cross of suffering in, the, in playing his part, its part in the crucifixion. Um, and now he, as, uh, he is rewarded um, as a Thane rewards his loyal liegeman. And he talks again, he tells, now he tells the, the dreamer what the dreamer is supposed to do with this story. It's not just a dream. Now I bid you, or command you, my beloved hero, that you reveal this vision to men Tell them in words that it is the tree of glory on which Almighty God suffered for mankind's many sins and Adam's ancient deeds. So the cross's job was to suffer. The dreamer's job is to evangelize. Death he tasted there. The Lord rose again with his great might to help mankind. He ascended into heaven. He will come again to this middle earth to seek mankind on doomsday. Almighty God, the Lord himself, and his angels with him, and he will judge. He has the power of judgment, each one of them as they have earned beforehand here in this loaned life. Um, there are a few things there. One, you know, though, though he, the cross manages to um, reiterate the, the, the resurrection, um, and, and then he moves right to judgment day and the fact that everybody is going to have to account for their, their sins. Um, and that reference to loaned life is also an Anglo-Saxon reference. The, the poetry is, is completely shot through with this notion, as was, as was is the, the Christian literature today, um, of the transience of life. That, um, and that was partly in, in part because death was so, so common um, then that, that the idea that death could come at any time was, was common. And the idea that life was just on, alone, not something that was permanent. And so the idea was that you better shape up. No one there may be unafraid at the words which the ruler will speak. He will ask before the multitude where the man might be who for the Lord's name would taste bitter death, as he did earlier on that tree. But they will tremble then and little think what they might even begin to say to Christ. But no one there need be very afraid who has borne in his breast the best of beacons. But through the cross shall seek the kingdom every soul from this earthly way, whoever thinks to rest with the rulers. And there's the end, the other quotation mark. So that's the end of where the cross speaks. And what does he end with? He ends reminding the, the dreamer that there is going to be a judgment, but also telling him what? That he's, he, if he looks to the cross, he can be saved. And at judgment day, which is going to be terrifying for everybody, he needn't be very afraid. 
if he's lived by the cross. Then I prayed to the tree with a happy heart, eagerly where I was alone with little company. So now the speaker is the eye again. I'm sorry, the dreamer is the speaker. My spirit longed to start the journey forth. It has felt so much of longing. It is now my life's hope that I may seek the tree of victory alone more often than, uh, than all men and honor it well. I wish for that with all my heart, and my hope it, of protection is fixed on the cross. I have few wealthy friends on earth. They have all gone forth, fled from worldly joys, and sought the king of glory. They live now in heaven with the high father and dwell in glory, and each day I look forward to the time when the cross of the Lord on which I have looked while here on this earth will fetch me from this loaned life again, um, that sense of, of, of impermanence, um, and bring me where, the, where there is great bliss, joy in heaven, where the Lord's host is seated at the feast with ceaseless bliss. And of course, the feast is a really important aspect. Uh, and we, we talk about the feast as well in Christianity, but it was also, it was a, a crossover image because it was a really important aspect of Anglo-Saxon life, the, the feast when everybody got together uh, and, and celebrated was um, a big deal. And then set me where I may afterwards dwell in glory, share joy fully with the saints. May the Lord be, and there's a kind of benediction, may the Lord be my friend, he who here on earth once suffered on the hanging tree for human sin. He ransomed us and gave us life, a heavenly home. Then he does, then the speaker refers to the harrowing, harrowing of hell. Um, in, in the last lines, that, 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 that idea that Jesus, after his death on the cross, went into hell and took the, and, and saved the, the souls that had been unjustly put there by Satan um, and takes them up to heaven. Hope was renewed with cheer and bliss for those who were burning there. That's those, unjust, those unjustly punished souls. The son was successful in that journey, mighty, mighty and victorious, when he came with a multitude, a great host of souls, into God's kingdom, the one ruler almighty, the angels rejoicing, and all the saints already in heaven, dwelling in glory, when almighty God, their ruler, returned to his rightful home. So they, they, it ends, it, it, I think the, the speaker, the dreamer, the poet, probably ends the poem with the harrowing of hell, because it's an example it's in, in already in tradition of that triumphant entry of Christ with saved souls, triumphant entry into heaven. And it's the image of a great and powerful um, and much loved leader and Lord. Um, and it's also the image, it ends with the image of a permanent home as opposed to this loaned life that, that we're all living. So that is what I think a piece of evangelization from the, the dark ages, which don't seem very dark when you read something like that. In it, Christ speaks to the cross through his heroic action. The cross speaks to the dreamer. The dreamer speaks to us. And the logical question is, what are we supposed to do? Okay, thank you. <laughs>